What does it take to turn a skeptic into a believer? I couldn't control my own body. <laughs> Mark and Rebecca Spencer are about to learn the hard way. It was about five or six seconds of sheer terror. Their dream house turns into a nightmare. <laughs> when they discover its horrific past. Hearing all those voices just really changed my life. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary times. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Monticello, Arkansas, 2005. For the past 18 years, Mark Spencer has been a department chairman at a university in Oklahoma, but he's interviewing for a new position at the University of Arkansas. I ended up coming out here for the interview. Rebecca and the boys came with me, and we found the town charming, and I was really drawn to the sense of history here. Look at that one. While out walking one afternoon, a large mansion catches Rebecca's attention. We just looked at it in almost disbelief that a house like that existed because it was so unique. If we're gonna move here, I want that house. I was rather drawn to Monticello in a, a somewhat mysterious way, I suppose. I could have stayed where I was, which would have been safe. I would have made more money, <laughs> but I just really felt drawn to the town. <laughs> The following day, Mark accepts the job. Rebecca is thrilled. She can now pursue her dream house. That afternoon, they pay a visit to the owner. I wanted that house. Short of the devil walking out the front door, I was gonna buy it. It was all kind of gloomy and, and eerie. What am I supposed to say? I'm just telling you the new dean of the university and you love the house. If she doesn't slam the door in your face, tell her you want to buy it. After getting a close look at the house, I was having some serious second thoughts about trying to buy it because it seemed to be in such a dilapidated state. But what Mark doesn't realize is that this house is not dead. It's very much alive. This thing shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the... I think the idea that frightened me was that whoever owned this house would be listening to such a radio program in the middle of the afternoon. I was a little bit afraid of what the owner was going to be like. No rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and who ever receiveth the mark of his I was glad that nobody answered the door. This place looks like a money pit to me. Although the house is in disrepair, there's something about it that still fascinates Rebecca. I think he was trying to discourage me, but it didn't, it didn't work. I still wanted the house, it didn't matter. 
It didn't really matter what he said. The Spencers ask everyone they know about the house on North Main Street, hoping someone can lead them to the owner. We thought maybe we could go to a real estate agent and the real estate agent could approach the owner and see whether the owner might be interested in, in an offer. We are interested in a particular house. Mm. Great. It's the one on the corner of North Main and Oakland? You mean the Allen house? Hasn't anyone told you? It's haunted. I just figured, you know, it's a small town. Every small town has a haunted house. And she just said, well, you know, that that's not the kind of house you want to talk about. It's not, it's not for sale or anything. And the woman that owns it would never sell it anyways. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that house. I didn't immediately assume that there was something weird about the house. No, I was more inclined to think there was something weird about the real estate agent. In the meantime, Mark investigates the haunted history of the Allen house. He wonders if the rumors are true. I did an internet search one day, just, you know, typed in Allen House, Monticello, Arkansas, and a whole bunch of websites came up, and they were all about paranormal activity associated with the house. And apparently the house had had a reputation for paranormal activity for over half a century. The house was built in 1906 for Joe Lee Allen, one of the wealthiest businessmen in Arkansas. Allen had three daughters. Liddell, the middle child, was apparently his favorite. Liddell Allen got married when she was 19. The marriage didn't last. Liddell moved back to her childhood home where she lived with her mother. It was there that she committed suicide on Christmas night, 1948. No one knew why. Hello? Is this Dean Spencer? I got a call from the owner of the house and she said that she understood that I wanted to buy her house. She said that she would have to meet us, and after she met us, she would decide whether she would consider talking about selling the house. Mark and Rebecca will need to wait several weeks until the owner returns from an out-of-town trip. But in the meantime, they often visit the Allen house, anticipating the day they can finally go inside. Are we really gonna live here? Maybe. Definitely. <laughs> oh, that must be Miss Marilyn. I saw a woman sitting in the window, and she looked like she was sitting at a desk, maybe, reading or, or writing a letter. Come on, guys, let's go. We don't want to activate the neighborhood. Watch. <laughs> I didn't want her to look and see us and then recognize us later and think, oh, well, they were stalking the house. But finally, the day comes. Mark and Rebecca will step into the Allen house for the first time. Welcome to Allen House. I'm Mark. We spoke on the phone. I definitely anticipated some sort of magic when I walked in the front door, and, and it felt that way. It felt like I was walking into something that was even better than I had imagined. The lady who owned the house had a lot of nice things. So it looked good, but it also felt good. I had a good feeling about the house. It felt warm. The second floor isn't in such good shape. This is the master bedroom. Is this the room that overlooks the street? Yes. I immediately could see that this was the second story room in which we had seen the woman in the window. And what was surprising was that we couldn't get into the room because the room was packed full of furniture and boxes. You must have done a lot of heavy lifting to get these boxes in here. We saw you sitting at the front window just a few days ago. I haven't been in this room for months. I figured that my wife and the kids and I had all experienced some sort of common optical illusion. Maybe it was a ghost. I'm sure you've heard by now that this house is haunted. 
<laughs> we don't believe in that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, but it's true. This house is haunted. She told Mark that he would hear lots of stories about it, but not to worry because she'd had the house um, exercised. When I first moved in here, I could hear the ghosts talking constantly. They don't talk as much now. My response to that was that, well, she was just probably a little crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I wanted to be polite, and after all, I was trying to buy her house. So <laughs> I just kind of went along and said, oh, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> Well, we've got to be going. We've yeah. got to pick our son up from school. But thank you so much for showing us your beautiful home. Mm. Glad you like it. I think the house likes you, too. That's when she first came out and said that she was thinking of selling her palace and that God must have brought us to her because we were the types of people that she would want to sell her palace to. But yes, I think I'm supposed to do this. She said that she was surprised to find herself saying that because she never thought she would sell the house. But she had a feeling about me and Rebecca. She said that for some reason, she felt that we were meant to own it. Done. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I have to hug you. But little did they know, they're moving into a house with a very dark past. We felt that the house needed to be saved and that we were the ones to save it. Perhaps Mark and Rebecca were chosen to own the house. But just what were they chosen for? You ready for house? <laughs> Soon after the Spencer family moves in, Monticello residents start showing up hoping to get a first-hand look at the infamous haunted house. We heard that you were letting people come in to see the haunted house. They would show up at the door, and they would say, hey, we want to come and see inside. And I'm like, well, I don't know who told you you could come inside my house, but you can't. Would you have a stranger come into your house and look around? No. Sorry. I just knew right from the start when the kids started showing up at the door and then later adults showing up at the door, that the house was of interest to everybody. And there was no way I was going to be able to just say, go away and don't come back. In the following months, the Spencers concentrate on renovating the historic house. Have you been at this long? I uh, just started, actually. I convinced Lauren to take the kids. We did most of the work ourselves because we enjoy hands-on projects, but also for the financial reasons. Taking on the project and hiring someone to do every little part of it would have just been too costly. Could you run up to the attic real quick and grab me a screwdriver? No problem. I was working 50 to 60 hours a week at the university, and then every spare moment I had, I was at home working around the house. I don't think that I could have worked as hard as I did on the house if I wasn't so much in love with the house. While Mark loves the house, he's also mystified by it. The attic, in particular, holds great mystery. I was fascinated with the attic. In a way, I, I loved the attic, but I also was afraid of it. And I can't give you a rational explanation as to why I was afraid of it, but, but right from the start, right after we moved into the house, I, I was somewhat afraid of it.
One of the little things that I found in the attic was half of a photograph of an infant. And on the back of it was enough of an inscription to determine that it said Miss Liddell. And I wondered, why would anybody tear a photograph of a, of a baby in half? But then, something unusual catches his eye. I stood there kind of mesmerized because it was such an interesting play of light and shadow, I thought. You know, I, was, I was trying to figure out where the light was coming from and how the, my shadow was getting cast all the way around the other side of the attic. And then what was really strange was that when I moved, my shadow didn't move. I thought, oh, okay, well, I've been, I've been working too much. At the time, I was just determined really not, not to think much about it. I figured, well, there must be some explanation. I just don't have it at the moment. But who was this mysterious Liddell? The next day, Rebecca follows up and discovers that this woman grew up in the house and later died of an overdose at the age of 54. The only thing I really understood about Liddell from the newspaper was her obituary. That said the most about her. It really said that she was a very well-loved woman who cared for everyone but herself. four very heavy footsteps above me in the attic. I was absolutely certain that someone had snuck in the house and was hiding out up there. After hearing footsteps in the attic, Rebecca believes an intruder has broken in. But shortly after, the sounds of footsteps disappear. It made me pause. It made me go back and think about some of the stories people had said about the house. Things I had disregarded, things I thought were silly, now became a reality to me. Those became real stories because now they were my stories. In the following days, the Spencers discuss a more concrete problem with their new house. We have got to hire someone to come in and insulate the walls. The electric bill is getting higher and higher every month. We were quickly going broke doing these renovations. Paint and wallpaper and, and lumber, all of these things are pretty expensive. Oh, we got a letter from those uh, ghost hunter people. I'll take a letter any day over people just showing up on the front porch. I had to turn another one away today. She must have been 90, and she was pushier than the kids, as if she expects us to give guided tours. Well, why don't we? I mean, Halloween is coming up. We could charge five bucks a head. It would help pay for the renovations. Well, when Rebecca came up with the idea of giving some tours at Halloween, I thought, well, it, it can't hurt. On Halloween night, 
the Allen House opens its doors to the public for the first time. You're not going to believe this. The line stretches all the way around the block. I thought it would be great if 50 people showed up and, and paid to tour the house. And we had 600. Welcome to Allen House. Some of the people, when they came up on the porch to wait for their turn to go in the house, were so scared that they were shaking. They thought something was going to just jump out and get them, and they were going to have a real, true, haunted experience. The Spencers have hired a group of local students to lead the tours. All right, first group, follow me, please. One of those students is Shane Curry. That first group was really more interested in, like, the ghost stories. That's what they really came for. You've all heard about Liddell Allen who supposedly haunts this house. This is the room where she killed herself, right over there. It was Christmas Eve, 1948. Caddy Allen, Liddell's mother, was hosting her annual Christmas party. Liddell was, of course, in attendance. We'd heard some accounts of the Christmas party of Liddell seeming a lot more somber than she usually was. By the end of the party, Liddell appeared disheartened, but no one could understand why an otherwise cheerful woman seemed so depressed. At one point late in the evening, she prepared herself a plate of hors d'oeuvres and a glass of punch, and she went upstairs. Late that very same night, Liddell decided to end her own life. She suffered for about a week before she finally passed away. Her mother came home and sealed up this room. No one came in here for the next 37 years until the Allen family sold the house. That's when the ghost stories began. You don't actually believe those stories, do you? story, the lights flickered, and a shirt flew out of the closet. <laughs> nice trick. Did you rig that up with some wires or something? I didn't do that. Everyone looked at me like, you know, how did you do that? That was cool. I'm like, that, I don't know how that just happened. Yeah, right. See for yourself. And I'm freaking out, because I don't know why that just happened. He goes and he looks, and there's nothing in there but a pile of clothes. I don't want to be in here anymore. People were definitely freaked out once they realized that that was not, you know, a gimmick, that we hadn't planned for a shirt to fly out the closet. Some of them wanted to go ahead and leave. Some of them wanted to hurry up and finish the tour. It is obvious that Liddell does not care for the idea of strangers touring her home. And she'll make sure they'll never come back. DestinationAmerica.com. A simple tour of the haunted Allen house has turned into much more than anyone planned. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I saw her. She's still here. Who? Liddell. We had an older lady on the tour who came up to me as she was leaving the house and, and told me that when she was on the second floor, she saw a, a lady in a Victorian dress. She was saying she thought she had seen Liddell. Why is 
is she so sad? I, I, I don't know. People who came on the tour, they all wanted to know what our ideas were or what we knew about Liddell's suicide. And the fact is, nobody knew why she had committed suicide. Thank you so much for opening your house to us. I'll never forget this. Oh, I saw her, I saw her. <laughs> After the excitement of Halloween, the Spencers returned to their routines, still working hard to make the house their own. But someone is intent on distracting them. stopped instantly and what's odd about that is that it's it's wound up with a spring so if someone had actually wound it up and you were to put the needle down it would either play or it would just slowly wind itself out but it stopped instantly so it wasn't wound at all Rebecca goes upstairs to tell her husband what she saw but something stops her dead in her tracks controlling me. I had to feel what it wanted me to feel. Rebecca! It was about five or six seconds of almost sheer terror. What's wrong? I saw something. A ghost. It's as if Liddell is trying to tell her something. But what? I still wasn't really convinced, I guess, um, for myself. I, it wasn't that I, I thought that she was crazy, but I suppose I just wanted to see it for myself. Come on, honey. I think maybe it's time we let one of those paranormal groups come and investigate. I wanted concrete evidence of paranormal activity before I was going to be able to say, yeah, this house is haunted. The Spencers invite a team of paranormal experts from Louisiana Spirits to conduct an investigation of the Allen House. Among the investigators is Bess Maxwell. You could feel the history of that house, and you could feel you could feel the house. I don't know that I've ever been any other place that you could just feel the spirit of the house like the Allen House. We really didn't understand what the protocol was for having paranormal investigators in one's home. So we sent the kids off to friends' houses for the night, and Rebecca and I decided that we would go out and leave the house to the investigators. We've never left anyone alone in the house before. <laughs> Don't worry. We do this kind of thing all the time. We'll be fine. Rebecca Spencer's concerns were she always felt that the Allen house had its own distinct personality. She looked at the house as being almost a person in and of itself. And she was just kind of worried that, the, as strange as it sounds, the house would not like us being there. You ready? I guess so. That night, I felt that something was a little off. Mark felt something was a little off. We just weren't sure what to do, so we chose to leave. But I think we both knew right from the start that we shouldn't do that. I felt a little 
dizzy coming down the stairs. I, I didn't think too much of it at the time. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I need to eat or something. But I did, I, I, I felt like the air was suddenly charged in some way. <sighs> I'm okay, come on. But Let's Mark is far from okay. Perhaps it's a warning of events yet to come. What After Mark and Rebecca leave for the evening, the investigators continue their attempt to solve the Allen House mystery. The attic has always been the focal point of a lot of the activity in the house. Bess uses an EMF meter to pick up on electronic frequencies. When it lights up, it suggests the presence of spiritual activity. one of the other investigators was coming up behind me and had just said her name. She had not been behind me. So where the voice came from, I don't know. Meanwhile, Rachel Ellis sets up a camera in the master bedroom. I could hear a lady singing really softly, but there was nobody in there with me. Maybe nobody inside. It was like lightning all around the house. Everything is dead except the audio recorders. All electricity went out. There was no electricity whatsoever, but our recorders were still on. I saw sparks outside just before the lights went out. It must have been a transformer. The neighbors still have power. Then we realized that, well, it could have been the transformer because we were the only house with no electricity. The houses next door on either side, the house across the street, their lights were on. So it was just us. I better call Rebecca. Mm -hmm. We were just a few blocks from the house when my phone rang, and it was one of the investigators. My immediate feeling was I knew it. I knew we shouldn't have left the house. What happened? Come on, follow me. I want to show you something. Here, be careful. And watch the wire. Without any probable explanation, a branch has fallen on the power lines. I'm not a big believer in coincidences, so it just seemed too odd to just say, well, it's just a limb just happened to fall off the tree just as we were about to begin our investigation. It was just too strange. It's perfectly still. There's no breeze. It's not raining. The tree limb is a big, leafy limb, or what appears to be a perfectly healthy tree. Since most of the equipment that the investigators use is electrical, the blackout effectively ends the investigation. A few days later, Bess Maxwell returns with surprising news. We taped this a few seconds after the power went out. During their investigation, they record several disembodied voices known as electronic voice phenomena. What happened? I don't know. Everything is dead except the audio recorders. I saw sparks outside just before the lights went out. It must have been a transformer. No, I'm not transformer. Not a transformer. No, not a transformer. Hearing all those voices just really freaked me out. The neighbors still have power. I better call Rebecca. I've never heard anything like this. And there are more. Hearing all the EVPs that LA Spirits have recorded during the investigation really changed my life, I think. For me, 
the truly amazing thing about this is that the voice seems to be responding to us in the moment as if it hears what we're saying and it's trying to talk to us. A lot of the things that we do deal with residual hauntings, which are not intelligent hauntings. It's just like something playing all over and over and over on a tape recorder. You can get EVPs from that too, but this was not that. Uh, this was an intelligent haunting. Uh, this was a spirit in the house that had an agenda. This spirit wants something from us. What does it want? Well, that's what we have to find out. We thought if maybe if we could reveal why Liddell killed herself and what was going on with her, maybe then she would be done with her earthly business. The Spencers continue to be haunted by unanswered questions about the suicide of Liddell Allen Barner. It's a mystery they cannot ignore. Marcus tried to understand things rationally, but now his instincts take over. One Saturday morning, I woke up and I immediately felt the compulsion to go to the attic. I was arguing with myself that there wasn't any reason to go to the attic because I had scoured the attic many times and I was convinced that I had found everything that there was to be found. But this voice in my head just was nagging me, you've got to go to the attic. First, I didn't see anything. Still, there's, you know, like this voice in my head telling me, look closer. And it was almost like a hand was on my shoulder, pushing me down. smaller white envelopes, and these were all letters. And they were all postmarked in 1948, and they were all addressed to Liddell Allen Bonner. They were all written to her, obviously, in the last year of her life. I thought that I was dreaming. I, I really was waiting to wake up. Mark is one step closer to solving the mystery as he's about to discover the shocking truth of Miss Liddell Allen. After trying to decipher the paranormal disturbances in the house, Mark is led to the attic and discovers a stash of hidden letters. The truth behind Liddell's suicide is finally before him. Mark? I literally blinked fast several times, and it was Rebecca coming toward me. What's wrong? I think that the transition between seeing Liddell and then seeing Rebecca, I think that it, it was meant that way. I, I think that Liddell was probably using Rebecca's energy to show herself to me. 
I know why Liddell killed herself. Later that afternoon, Mark and Rebecca read through all 82 letters, hoping to unveil the mystery behind Liddell's secret past. Obviously, these were letters from a man who was madly in love with Liddell. You certainly are as near the Dell I knew years ago as you could possibly be. The Dell's admirer was a gentleman named Prentice Hemingway Savage. Prentice was vice president of Texaco Oil in 1948. He lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but he had grown up here in Monticello. The Dell and Prentice dated as teenagers. Years later, as adults, they rekindled their love. Hello, Adele. But this time, something Hello, was different. Prentice. Prentice was married. In July 1948, Liddell arranged to meet Prentice in Milwaukee. It ended on a promise to spend the rest of their lives together. Liddell returned home, and they began making plans through a series of letters. But then, Prentice stopped writing. Reality just got in the way. And this man couldn't leave his wife because he couldn't accept the scandal that his wife would stir up in the newspapers because he was vice president of Texaco Oil. And on Christmas night, 1948, Liddell finally sealed her fate. I think that she hoped that Prentice would arrive, would, would show up, would surprise her. The man she loved never arrived. Her dreams were broken, and she gave up hope of ever being happy again. I'm reading these letters full of these wild promises and declarations of love, but I know how it ends. She knew he wasn't coming back. I felt sad for her. And at the same time, I felt a sort of happiness that now we knew. And obviously, she wanted us to know. We would not have discovered those letters any other way. She had to have wanted us to, to know the story. She had nothing left, and she couldn't pretend anymore. We'll make sure everybody knows that. From the first moment we saw the house till now, all of it has felt like it was destiny or some sort of fate that brought us to this town. I really feel like, like we are where we're supposed to be. What I think I've experienced following my discovery of the letters is a greater awareness of Liddell's presence. I think that connection she made with me the day that I discovered the letters has, you know, opened a sort of door. Um, and, and there is a, a connection between me and her. Mark has no doubt that Liddell has chosen him to tell her story. He decides to write a book about his experiences, the house, and the truth behind the untimely death of Liddell Allen Bonner. Hope of a new life and new dreams. There it is. It's gonna be great. Is shattered by a ghostly intruder. Is anybody out there? He's a man in search of lost love, but he's got the wrong woman. Ah! I saw you kissing him. When past and present collide, you were out with some guy, weren't you? Weren't you? A family hangs in the balance. I felt overwhelmed with anger and couldn't figure out why. This erratic, crazy, possessed behavior, it terrified me. Chris, no! In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows 
and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see Someone's in my room. and the things we fear, there are doors when they are opened. Nightmares become reality. In 2012, Whitney and Chris Morris moved to a small town outside Omaha to raise their daughter, Lily. UTN's a very super family-friendly place to be. And it's a good community. I mean, everyone comes together, and it's tight-knit. Rolling up to the brand spanking new house. We were living in a two-bedroom apartment at the time, and we decided that if we are going to raise a family, we needed a home. It was like the perfect house. It had the perfect amount of rooms to grow into. Lily thought it was the most amazing thing she had ever seen in her life. There it is. It's going to be great. I love that we had our own house something to call her own. It made you feel like uh, you accomplished something. Oh, hey, look. There's a lot of kids running around when we first pulled up. Kids about Lily's age. Why don't you go play with the other kids? It seemed like a place that would be great for my daughter. That didn't take long at all, did it? No. Over the next few days, the Morris family settles comfortably into their home. What are you doing out of bed? Is everything OK? The man, he's so mad. He keeps yelling. I thought maybe it was a nightmare. I just figured, you know, it was just different sounds, different things going on, and it's an older house that creaks. You probably just had a bad dream. He won't let me go to sleep. Do you want to stay with us? Okay. But just for tonight. One morning, Chris, a stay-at-home dad, is working in his garage. You hold that, I'll hold this. I'm a mechanic, I build cars, and it's about all I know for work. Can you hand me that adjustable one? Thank you. I was real lucky I got to spend that much time with Lillian. 
this is what I need. Didn't matter what we were doing, whether we were in the garage or outside or playing, it didn't matter. We were always together. We were inseparable. All right, guys. I'm heading out. All righty. I'm a hairstylist, so since I was the working parent at the time, it ended up being perfect because he can take care of Lily. You helping your dad work on the car? Well, kind of. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> I'm sure he's happy to have you help. All right, give Mommy a kiss. Did you brush your teeth? I didn't think so. Go brush them. She was told to, I promise. Oh, OK. All right. Well, got a lot of appointments. I'll probably be late tonight. That's OK. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. so I'll see you later tonight. OK. OK. <laughs> Give me a call before you head back, yeah? Okay. That night, Whitney returns to a quiet house. Someone was there. I felt like I was being watched. Soon after moving into a new home and neighborhood, Whitney Morris has the distinct feeling someone is lurking outside. It was the most intense, crazy, unsettling feeling I've had in my life. Is anybody out there? Scare you? I could have sworn somebody was watching me. It's just one of those weird feelings. And I just got all paranoid. You want me to check outside? I thought it was just her nerves or something like that. No. I told her, it's no big deal. It's a new house. It's how it goes. It's something new for all of us. After all those years of living in an apartment, I just need to get used to all this space. Yeah, I think we all do. Come on, let's go to bed. OK. All right. Over the next few days, Whitney tries to forget about the frightening event. I was the new person in the neighborhood, so I just figured People are checking me out, trying to figure out, you know, who's this family that moved in.
How's the car coming? Daddy, what's wrong? Are you okay? Chris is standing there, just dead staring at me. He's not moving. He's not blinking. He's not doing anything. You look weird. It was almost like watching someone when they sleepwalk. They're functioning, but they're not there. Daddy. I don't know, baby. I don't know. One evening, Whitney comes home late from work. It took me forever to get out of there tonight. My last appointment was such a diva. I kept calling you, texting you. You never responded. You got real short with me. It seemed to come out of nowhere. I'm sorry, honey. I was just trying to finish up as fast as I could. But you're right, I should have called. What? It's not like I was out partying. That's exactly what you were doing. You were out with some guy, weren't you? Weren't you? I felt overwhelmed with anger and couldn't figure out why. It was not like me at all to be as jealous as I was. What are you talking about? I was working. He made an assumption that I was with another man, which would never, you know, I mean, it was a crazy accusation. I know you've been cheating on me. I can feel it. When I find out who it is, I swear. So help me. What are you saying? Look, let's not do this now. Not in front of Lily. But Whitney can't stop thinking about the confrontation. I was afraid. I had no idea what was going on with him. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to think. It didn't matter what I did to defuse the situation. It kept getting worse and worse and worse. Ever since the Morris family moved into their new house, Whitney has noticed a drastic change in her husband's personality. Chris has been acting unlike himself, as if he were in a trance. He was being troubled by something. 
Was it something I had done wrong? Honey? I kind of questioned myself on what was really happening and what was really going on. I didn't know how to hold it together. I felt helpless. I felt alone. I felt like we were falling apart. <gasps> I heard the gunshot clear as day. I was terrified. Where have you been? Did you hear that gunshot? Once again, Chris seems disconnected. I'm wondering, is he doing drugs? Is he drinking? Or is his brain failing him? You know, I thought that Chris had officially went off the deep end. And Whitney isn't the only member of the family who feels the tension. Chris's strange behavior has driven a wedge between him and his daughter. I was worried daily about Lily because Lily used to hang out with Chris all the time. And they went from inseparable to Lily just wanting to play in her room because Daddy didn't talk much anymore. Whitney vows to shelter her daughter as best she can until she can figure out what to do. Where's Daddy? Oh, he had to go get a part for that car he's working on. He'll be back. I grew up never seeing my mother upset, ever. And I wanted Lily to have that kind of a family upbringing. So her seeing me upset and her seeing her dad upset, she was just confused. I tried to hide it as much as I could. I know. How about a bedtime story? Dad home? Chris? It's not Daddy. It's that man I've always seen around the house. He's the one who keeps me up at night. Who is he? She turns and looks at me and she goes, who is that, Mommy? She sees somebody. She says she's seeing a man. Mommy will be right back. I thought, oh my gosh, there's someone in the house. What do I do? I can hear someone talking, and I realize it's from me and Chris's bedroom. Chris? Whitney then makes out two voices. I don't want another man touching you. What is your problem? She don't own me, okay? It was argumentative. They were fighting. I can hang out with whoever I want. You're giving me everything. And then it was like this energy that came over me. I don't want another man. There's no way to describe what that felt like. There was something everywhere. You never loved me. It was 
from underneath me. It was on the side of me. It was on top of me. He's standing there, just looking at me, clear as day. A white, just plain t-shirt with kind of faded jeans. And I realized I just saw who is in my house. That is who is in my house. A disturbing presence has been causing trouble in the Morris family home. Who is he? Things kept getting worse and worse in the house, and now my daughter is involved. I'm like, there's more to this, but what is it, and what's going to happen now? What are you doing here? What, I can't stop by and see my girlfriend? Then one night, Whitney hears voices and finally comes face to face with a ghost. Lily starts screaming with this uncontrollable, psychotic, blood-curdling scream. What happened? Did someone hurt you? Who was it? Who was here? Lily is this shade of white I've never seen in my child before. She's terrified. It's OK, baby. Mommy's here. I was in such a state of panic. There's no doubt in my mind at this point that there's a ghost, there's a spirit, and what does it want? I was just beside myself. I didn't know what to do or what to even think about the situation. I just wanted to run away and pretend like it didn't happen, but I had no one to run to. Unsure of what to do next, Whitney scours the internet for answers. The thought of anything happening to Lily was my absolute breaking point. I began searching for anything, something. She comes across a group that investigates paranormal activity. Yes, I think there's a spirit in my house. I had found Paracon and found Brian Kent. I immediately called him. I really need your help. I felt a sense of urgency because of how it was affecting the family. Whatever was in the house was possibly trying to get a hold of Whitney. She mentioned that her husband was going through some personality changes. Lily was seeing things that were terrifying her, and I was afraid of what might be next. But before Brian and his team can investigate, Whitney must confront her husband. I was scared, but at the same time, I needed to make a true effort to talk to Chris about what I feel is happening, that I think that it's paranormal, that there's energy that's affecting our family. I need to talk to you. So 
Something happened to both me and Lily last night. That makes me think that there's some sort of ghost in our house. I already reached out to somebody for help. I know things have been rocky between us lately. All I want is to make things better. But I need you to hear me out. It's a little late for all this, don't you think? It's never too late. You have to know that I love you. He looks at me. I knew he was going to go off. I just could feel it. You love me? What about that other guy I saw you with? <laughs> Listen to me. There is a spirit in our house, and he's trying to turn you against me. Please believe me, there is no other guy. You are such a liar. He was just mad. <laughs> This erratic, crazy, possessed behavior. It terrified me. That wasn't my husband. You don't love me. You don't love me. You never you loved me. me. No, Chris, stop. Please, you're scared. You're scared. You never loved me. No. Whitney Morris believes a ghost is attempting to possess her husband. He's trying to turn you against me. You are such a liar. <laughs> and you just thrown it all away. You don't love me. You never loved Please, me. Please, no, Chris, stop. Please, you're scaring me. He was insane. I didn't really know what was happening. Chris, stop. <laughs> Suddenly, it's as if a spell has been broken. I just kind of stopped and I looked at her. I didn't realize what was going on. It was unbelievably scary, because that's not who I am. But I never hurt her. Baby, I don't know what's wrong with me. I need help. I don't know what's happening to me. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> there is no time to waste. Whitney will not rest until Paracon Investigations, the expert she found online, get to the bottom of the haunting. It felt like a waiting game. Like, is this going to happen again? Is the spirit going to take over my husband and something worse is going to happen? It's important that we thoroughly investigate every reason as to why these things may be occurring. Now, we try to debunk what's happening, you know, before just jumping to any conclusion that uh, there may be paranormal activity in the home. Excuse me? When we first entered the home for the investigation, you could tell that Whitney was scared. Her husband, Chris, seemed to be affected by something in the home. Whitney did mention to us that Chris's personality would change. It doesn't take long for the medium in the group to feel a presence. I'm go check the garage. I am a physical medium, so in situations where they needed to find out who the spirit is, that would be where I would step in. He was kind of standing in the corner, like in a shadow. He wore a letterman jacket, and he had really dark circles under his eyes. 
The ghost then makes it clear he has a story to tell. They can speak to me verbally, or the ones that can't, they throw pictures or video in my head. And then I can actually put it all together. It's like a big puzzle. He loved high school. He was popular, he wore his letterman jacket everywhere he went. He was with a girl, really pretty girl, his girlfriend at the time. He was just all in all a happy guy. But then their relationship turned sour. He was picking up on all of the emotions of sadness, jealousy, of anger. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing here? What, I can't stop by to see my girlfriend? Of course, come in. Who was that guy? He was just helping me study for my math test. I saw you kissing him. I don't want another man touching you. What is your problem? It's not like you own me. I can hang out with whoever I want. I've given you everything, and you've thrown it all away. You don't love me. You never loved me. Seeing him and his girlfriend separate and split, I could feel just complete sadness, just loss. There was no chance of repairing anything. He felt like he had no hope. He was sitting inside of a car in the garage, and I could see the handgun. For more haunting, visit destinationamerica.com. While investigating the Morris residence, physical medium Mary Potter receives visions from the spirit of a troubled young man. I saw that he was sitting in the front of the car. And then at that moment, I just heard the gunshot. He had shot himself. Mary gathers the paranormal team and the family to discuss her findings. I communicated with a ghost. Can you tell me what he looked like? He was young, barely out of his teens. I guess the best way to describe him would be he, he wears this Letterman jacket. When Mary is describing the entity, I'm thinking to myself, it fits, it matches the description of him. We're on the same page. And he didn't tell me his name. Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. Clear as day, the name kept repeating in my head. Jimmy. Jimmy. 
His name is Jimmy. You, you have the gift. Mary believes that Whitney's psychic abilities only serve to strengthen her connection with Jimmy. It suddenly made sense. It's like, okay, well, if I have a gift, I've pulled this spirit towards me, and this is why this was all happening. Why is he still here? Why is he haunting my family? In my vision, I saw her, the love of his life. The resemblance that Whitney has with her is uncanny. Whitney resembled his ex-girlfriend quite a bit, and it brought back all the feelings and things that he had had for her. She reminded him of everything that he had lost. He wanted to rekindle his relationship with her. He was using you, Chris, to do that. The spirit has been possessing you. He was going to find a way to be back here in a physical world and wanted to do that through my husband. There's a lot of emotions that run through when you think about something like that. The hurt and the pain that I caused my wife that I love. But at the same time, something or someone is with you everywhere. How did they have that control over you? I sensed Jemmy's presence, the strongest here in the garage. He's afraid of the afterlife. Jimmy had not crossed over yet. He feared judgment by a higher power for what he had done. He thought at that moment when it's time, nobody's going to want me. They're not going to accept me. I think Whitney is our best chance at getting him to cross over. The only resolution for this haunting was to address Jimmy and to make him aware um, that it's so much better once he goes over into the light. And I had asked Whitney to help out with that. Whitney, are you ready to help Jimmy? Yes. Good. He's waiting for you in the car. And I see Jimmy look up towards me and reach his hand through the window, and I reach my hand towards his. I didn't feel scared anymore. I felt like I just needed to help him through. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to quiet waters. He restores my soul. Mary just really sweetly and calmly and smoothly did a prayer and asked him to cross over, and it said that it was OK. The Lord forever. Amen. Jimmy, it's safe. It's OK. You can go. And this wind came through like a breeze. That was the last moment I had felt Jimmy. He was gone. He was at peace. It was like instantly knowing that it was going to be all right. I felt like the fog had lifted. No more anger, no more fighting. I got my family back. Although they no longer sense Jimmy's presence, the Morris family finds another place to live in July of 2013. But their experience with the paranormal is never far from their minds.
There's a lot of emotions that run through when you think about something like that. Do I believe in spirits now? Yes. Something I'll never forget. You silly monkey. <laughs> I have many encounters. I've really gotten to be more open with it now. I understand where the gift comes from. I understand what it can bring forward, and now I'm prepared for that. It's gorgeous. It's a perfect day for a picnic, huh? Uh, OK, and everybody's got their drink and a napkin. Yeah. Mary had let me know that Lily also has this gift of being able to see and feel and hear and witness things different than other people. Lily has experiences every once in a while. She'll bring up something to me. We just kind of go day by day and we move forward. <laughs>